What's up, Ben Salem? I'm Ashley. And I'm Danny. And over the winter, Solomon Brenner came to our school to talk to us about his philosophy. It was very inspirational, Danny, wasn't I, it? I agree. I, do you follow Smart Goals now? I always use Smart Goals. No matter awesome. what I am doing, Smart Goals applies to it. Yep, definitely. And I think the audience is really going to enjoy it once they find out what it is. They will, and they will learn a lot. A so lot. stay tuned to learn about this very inspirational man. My name is Solomon Brenner from Action Karate, and you're watching OTN. So it's an honor for me to be here. I think this is absolutely fantastic. I can't imagine a class more important than the class that Mr. Mills is teaching you. My entire life revolves around those exact principles. When I was, I started martial arts when I was 14. When I was about 16, somebody started handing me Anthony Robbins tapes. I don't know if you guys study Anthony Robbins directly, but you can YouTube him or whatever. He was a motivational speaker, life coach kind of person of that time. And I started to follow those principles. So I'm taking karate. You know, I'm obviously in high school. I take karate pretty much every day. I, I just love the martial arts. I was a product of the original karate kid, just thought it was cool. And I started to watch the business of the martial arts, thought that was great. Now at the time, I also thought that I was going to be a, I always loved numbers, I liked money, I liked investing, I was always into the stock market. So I thought I was going to be some kind of investment guru, I was going to live on Wall Street, of course overlooking the water in a big swanky, huge condo, wear an exceptionally fancy Italian suit every day, um, you know, beautiful cars, beautiful women, and that's what I'd be doing all the time. What I quickly learned was that idea of Wall Street from TV was nothing like what it really was. And when I began to investigate what they really did, um, other than the, fan, you know, the ton of money they made, I realized that most of them had worked 12 to 15 hours a day or more, tons of ulcers, lots of anxiety, had no family life, didn't really travel very much because they worked constantly. So now I've been training in all this you know, doing, besides doing the martial arts, also all this life coaching, all this guru type stuff. And what I realized was I wanted to have, I, I didn't really want to work that hard, but I did want to have a fantastic life. And I didn't want to work that much, but I wanted to have a fantastic life. And so when I was 20, I was in school. I was going to Philadelphia Community College. And for you guys that are deciding where you're going to go to school, and you're thinking, oh, that's lame, that's terrible. I graduated from St. Joe's. Because um, all that really matters is what your diploma says at the end. And I also, somebody taught me very early, is that poor people pay interest, rich people collect interest. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't graduate with pretty much, I didn't want any debt when I graduated college. And it was a very important principle for me. So I knew if I went to Philadelphia Community College, I would, um, would be way, it would just be way less expensive and I wouldn't have any debt. And I also knew that I wanted to have a more prestigious diploma on my wall. So the last two years I went to St. Joe's and really that's the only thing that when people ask me where'd you go to school I just say St. Joe's and that's that and all my friends at the time when they graduated college had enormous amounts of debt I, I didn't have none but I had almost none it was it was just a few thousand dollars which was fine so at age 20 while in school we decided my and I know Mr. Mill said that I started the whole thing and I'm sort of the figurehead for the situation but my partner um, Jacqueline was my partner from the beginning in the business. She's an outrageous part of the success. And I also prided myself on, I was always surrounded by not only people that were smarter than me, clearly, but also that were outrageously supportive of the good things I did and the bad things I did. And when I say the bad things I did, you know, bad business decisions and just, you know, stupid ideas that I would later, of course, learn from. So went to, was going to college, opened the school when I was 20. And so here's what my life consisted of. I would wake up every morning, you know, 7.30. I lived in Northeast Philadelphia with my parents. I would drive to St. Joe's, 25 minutes from my house, take class around, my class would end anywhere from between noon and three. So somewhere between then, I would drive 45 minutes to Ben Salem. Our school was right next door to UltraZone. Drive 45 minutes all the way down US-1, and then I would begin work. I would work from that point until about 9, 9.30 every single day, six days a week, seven days a week. 
it was just an outrageous amount of work for about seven years. Um, I ran all the birthday parties. Some of you guys may have been to birthday parties at our schools. I have no idea. Some of you guys may have trained at some of our schools or younger brothers and sisters. Um, I was always there, period. If I was sick, the, the motto was have a cup of tea, go to work. Um, pretty much didn't vacation, didn't do anything, just worked. My life now is dramatically different. And one of the other principles that I learned really early on was you're either going to work really hard in the beginning and then don't work really hard later on, or you can work really hard for the rest of the time and kind of party it up. And uh, you know, some people do that in the beginning. So now here's my life, and I'm not exaggerating at all. During the summer, on Mondays, we have our staff meeting. So you know, I have to wake up around 7.30, and I'm, I'm ready for my staff meeting by 9.15. Everybody comes to see me. I don't have to go anywhere. I live approximately 15 steps from where I work. Um, so, and I put on my pajamas and I go run my staff meeting. My pajamas is my karate uniform, but if you ever wore karate uniform, it's pretty much pajamas. And I do my staff meeting. Now the rest of the week, Tuesday through Friday, I have a group of guys that I golf with. I'm on a tee box every single day at 6.15. I golf from 6.15 till about 9.30, 10. I then go to karate where I check my email for, for about a half hour. I then walk home 15 steps where um, my girlfriend slash business partner makes me lunch. We, we, this is seriously my life. I eat lunch. I then take a nap, not a nap like sitting somewhere. I take a nap in my bed, um, usually in my pajamas. And then I w after nap, I wake up snack. So I have, right now it's a smoothie and um, like a peanut butter with a pretty healthy kind of snack which is awesome, and then have the opportunity to walk 15 steps back in my pajamas again, where people come to see me, to bow to me, to, and, and I bow back, of course, it's a, it's a mutual respect, that's what a bow is, it's just like a funny way to look at it, where I get to teach them karate. Now, these are people that have a vested interest. They're paying me to teach them the same success principles that you're learning from Mr. Mills, and they're there for that reason. So then I have this huge honor to do that. Now, that's the summer. Now, in the winter, it's a little bit different. I don't like to wake up early in the winter, because it's so dark out and freezing, it's hard for me to get out of my outrageously comfortable bed. So in the winter, I now get up around, I guess it's really the same time, around 7.30 or 8. If I wasn't here right now, I'd be at the gym. I work out till about 10. I then drive directly to the chiropractor, where he does like some work on me, because I just like it. And I want to make sure that one of my goals is, is that when I'm older, I'm not one of these crippled older people that worked out their whole lives and now can't really move or walk. So I always want to make sure that I stay as healthy as I can. Then I go back to karate, check my email, eat lunch, nap, eat a snack, and then go to karate, and I'm home by about 9.30, again, my 15, it's like a 15-step walk. If I, leave my, if I leave my job at 9, I'm home by 9, um, and that's pretty much my life now. I travel probably four to six times a year. Some of it is, you know, little things like, you know, a week at the shore or... My sister lives in West Palm, so I go there to golf with my brother-in-law for five days and visit with her family. Other times, we do 21-day trips that are super luxurious in Europe. And when I say luxurious, like, these trips are ridiculous. Like, we will, like, leave our, the very nice cruise ship, and there'll be, a, it won't be, has anybody ever heard cruise before? So when you cruise, you go on the excursions and you go travel, and it's usually, like, 50 to 100 people on a bus, and you have to listen to them talk, and it's all these old people, and it's, it's okay, but it's not great. We, the way we do it is when we get off the ship, there's some person standing there in a fancy Mercedes just for us to like, you know, drive us around to look at sites and visit whatever. And that's pretty much my life now. Um, it's traveling, teaching karate, and doing whatever it is I feel like it. But the important thing is that I set my goals early, and all these success principles are exactly what I did. And a lot of people look at me now and say, oh, look, at, you know, you've done all this great stuff. All I did was copy other people. You know, I found somebody else that was best practices. I would interview them, I would corner them, I would talk to them forever until they eventually, you know, until, or not they eventually, until I eventually understood what they did, and then I would just do the exact same thing. And we still do that. We tra a lot of our travels, we always, we just went to Disney for five days, and two of the nights we spent at other martial arts schools that we read about and heard about that had super successful programs to see what they did that we can make our school better for our students, for the business end of it, for all of it. And so that's my life. 
So uh, Mr. Mills also talked to me to talk, asked me to talk about goal setting. If you don't think goal setting is important, it's only because you don't know how important it is. Peter Lowe ran success seminars probably when you, before you were born, and he would fill up like Wachovia Center with 30,000 people, and he would have Anthony Robbins, he would have President Bush, he would have um, generals, uh, Colin Powell, and they would all speak, and that's how they filled the arena with. He would have a bunch, he, Donald Trump, he would have famous people along with motivational people to fill the arena. And they did studies based on people that had goals programs that I'll share with you now, and you can do what you want with it, and people that didn't have goals programs. And the people that had goals program, or people that didn't have goals program on average, remember this is very dated, so don't, the, the numbers don't really matter, it's the percentage difference that matters. The people that did not have goals program earned on average, I think it was $2,741 a month. The people that did have goals program, again the one that I'll share with you, on average made like $5,700 a month. So again, the number doesn't matter because neither of those numbers are very high. But what matters is the results were double. The results were dramatically different and if the money doesn't matter, it's whatever it is that you want to achieve, whether it's the quality of your life or whatever it is you want to do, fitness-wise, spiritually, money-wise, you can do that by just setting your goals properly. So the goals program that we teach in our school, we teach it every January for set up for New Year's resolutions. It's pretty simple. It's just SMART goals. And SMART, we just go through each letter, one letter each week. The S stands for specific. You got to set a specific goal. So you can't have a wandering generality. So Zig Ziglar was one of my original um, mentors. I went to a ton of his seminars. I spoke to him on the phone a few times. Just awesome. And he talks about you want to be a meaningful, specific, not a wandering generality. So the example that we use in our school is if you say, I want to get an A in math, if you, if you want to get an A, that doesn't really do anything, but you need to get, say, like an A in math, and it's got to be as specific as possible. You also have to make it measurable. So some things you can measure, some things you can't. When you set your goals, you want to try your best to make it measurable. So for us, for one of our students, instead of saying, I want to kick higher, you know, you say, I want to kick as high as my shoulder with a specific kind of kick. Or instead of saying, I want to be better in the martial arts, I want to be a black belt. So you know what your specific goals are. And you know, so specific and measurable, I kind of think they're interchangeable. The second thing is achievable for you. Let's say you hate math, you hate science, and every time you see blood, you want to vomit. But you write down on a piece of paper, you want to be a doctor. It's probably not going to work out. For me, I would love to be a PGA on tour golfer. I love golf, I am terrible at golf. Now, three years ago, I had an opportunity to golf with a PGA pro. And when I say PGA pro, when I met him, I thought what he meant was, people say they're a PGA pro if they're a golf instructor. So when he told me, oh, I'm a PGA pro, I thought he was just a, an instructor, which of course I wanted to learn from him, but I didn't think much of, you know, I know a lot of PGA pro instructors. My girlfriend at the time said, I think that means he's on tour. I was like, this guy's not on tour. Are you kidding me? It turns out the week that I met him, for you guys that know anything about golf, he was in the British Open, which is the, one of the most prestigious golf tournaments in the world. So I, of course, asked him if we, he would mind if I took him out for a round of golf. He said, please call me. My, name, my number's in the phone book. I kind of thought he was blowing me off. So I said to him at the time, listen, if you are blowing me off, just tell me, because if not, I'm going to harass you until you play golf with me because the honor would be just so amazing. I, 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 trust me, you're not going to like these phone calls. I'm going to call you every week, so tell me the truth if you're not interested. And he said, no, 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 I'd love to golf with you. I golf with all kinds of people. So a few months later, he takes me to his golf course in Florida, which, again, if anybody here golfs, you have to show ID at the front gate. It was, it was one of the TPC golf courses. So the honor is outrageous. During that time, I said to him, so, if all I do is golf, this is it. Like money's no object, time is, I will hire, you know, Tiger Woods trainers, Phil Mickelson's trainers, I'm hiring all of them. All I'm gonna do is practice, they're gonna stand behind me, they're gonna tell me what to do. How long until I'm on tour? He said, never. I was like, oh, I was like, come on, seriously. It's all I do is practice. Like, I, I mean, you know, it takes some years, but I can get there. I'm not saying I'm Tiger Woods, but you know, I could be on like a mini tour. Not that maybe the PJ, but like the nationwide, something which is below the PJ. He said, never. I said, why? He said, you have no natural talent whatsoever in golf. <laughs> so, I, so the point of the SMART goal, specific, measurable, the A is attainable for you. No matter how much I'd want to be a PGA professional, you know, or a PGA tour player, according to him, it's never gonna happen in a million years. 
He discovered that he would be a PGA professional when he was 12 years old. His parents bought him golf clubs. He took five lessons. On the fifth one, the instructor said, go practice. You're good enough to be a tour player, and there's nothing left I can teach you. He was just naturally gifted. It just was what it was. So you have to decide what your natural gifts are, and whatever they are, that's what you should be doing, in my opinion, for the rest of your life. So you have to really figure out what that is. So we have this specific, measurable, attainable. The R is roadblocks. Whatever, you're going, whatever you want to achieve, there's got to be something that's going to mess you up. Um, if there's not, it's not that great of a goal. So sometimes you can figure out what's going to mess you up as you move forward. So let's say you have a fitness goal and you're trying to keep a certain, eat, you know, certain eating habits, but you know you're going out to your favorite restaurant and your favorite food's going to be there and your favorite food is you know, chicken pizza fries. So you are going to want to eat them. How are you going to deal with that when you get there? Are you going to you know, eat a little bit less? Or are you just going to eat less before you leave and eat a lot of that? You've got to come up with a plan before it ever happens, is the idea of roadblocks. You kind of write down what your roadblocks are in order to get there. And so we have specific, measurable, attainable roadblocks. And the last one is timetable. You've got to set a timeline. You've got to set a deadline for yourself. If not, it can go on forever. So let's say you say you want to get some, you know, you want to get an A in Mr. Mills. You want to get an A in one of your math classes. That could last forever, and that could be in graduate school someday. But if you say, I need to get an A in this class by the end of this semester, and then what you do if you want to take it to that next level, what we would call the black belt level, is you give yourself a consequence. And it can go two ways. One consequence could be you get to buy yourself something, something real positive, spend time with somebody, do something that you really enjoy. Or if you know you're really not going to follow through on that, you can do a negative consequence. So let's say there's somebody in one of your classes that you don't like at all. You can tell yourself you're going to have to take them to lunch, buy their lunch, and spend time with them. You don't even like talking to them. Now you're buying them stuff and spending time with them if you don't achieve your goal. And you know, every morning you wake up, you're like, there's no way I'm buying that person lunch. Or spending you know, 45 minutes with them. So you have to figure out a way to motivate yourself. There's only a few reasons I think Brian Tracy says, and I think you guys do Brian Tracy, right? So there's only a few reasons why people don't set goals. Number one is they don't realize how important it is. We know from the Peter Lowe study, and actually I'll share one more study with you of why it's important. Number two, they don't know how to do it. Um, you, bless you, you now know how to do it. It's pretty simple, just set your SMART goals. If you didn't take notes, you can Google SMART goals. Uh, it's very common, you can just find what each word means and just follow along. And then the third reason is people think if they set a goal, and they don't achieve it, they're going to feel like a failure. My belief is as long as you're working towards the goal, it doesn't, you're, you, you haven't failed yet. It's when you quit on the goal is when your failure really happens. So as long as you're working towards it, you shouldn't feel that way and as long as you're just moving. So again, if you haven't decided to set your goals yet, there was also a Harvard study. It was in the 1970s. And they asked the graduating class if they had a goals program. Now, Thinking like I want to do something is more of a wish. A goals program is setting your goals, writing them down. I know Mr. Mills does them in present tense, and that's a whole other level, which is spectacular. Doing your SMART goals, that's a goals program. Only 3% of the graduating class had a goals program. 3% of the Harvard graduating class. 10 years later, they were interviewed. That 3% had a higher net worth than the other 97% combined. That 3% had a higher net worth than the 97% combined. Now, I know different people have different thoughts on money, but two, th two things. One is, it, it, it's not about the money. money. Money and goal setting go hand in hand because it's easy to measure. You, know, you can look at your bank account, you can look at your net worth, and it's easy to measure. But it doesn't have to be about money. It just has to be about you can achieve 10 times more. Or according to Peter Lowe, double. Either way, it's dramatic. Um, and if any of you have bad thoughts on money, like money is the root of all evil, to me, money is nothing but opportunity. You can be not a nice person with money and use it to be mean to people and show people how much money you have and how great you are. Or you can use money for, you know, for good things, to help other people, to give to charities that you believe in and that you want to make an impact on, or having money allows you to spend more time with your family because you don't have to work as much. So money is just nothing but, to, to me at least, opportunity, and I've been on both sides of it. 
when we started, when I tell you we had nothing, we had nothing. Our, for two of us, my partner and I, for lunch every day, our option was to spend $5, period. And we had to figure out how we we're gonna have lunch every day for $5. Um, ne- you know, now having money, dramatically better, way better. Um, the trips that we get to take, the life experiences that we get to have, the security that we feel, and the people that we get to help. The reason we have so many schools is because we have the opportunity to help other people achieve the same goals, and us being financially secure makes that difference. So if you have any reservations about money, you just need to learn and you know, work towards it. So one of the th- things that we talk about, when I, again, going back to goal setting, is Howard Hill was the greatest archer of all time. And you're probably sick of my golf analogies, but he was pretty much the Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods from three years ago. Pretty much everybody was competing when he would show up to a tournament for archery. So archery, of course, is bow and arrow, trying to hit the bullseye. He would, everybody was competing for second place when he showed up. I mean, he was by far the best, hunting the most exotic animals, crazy birds that nobody could possibly hit. He was by far the best. The first shot, every shot, he would hit the bullseye. What would he do with the second shot? He, right, exactly. He would split the first arrow. And this was every time. It, it, just unbelievable. My belief is that I could help each and every one of you beat Howard Hill in his prime in archery. Now, of course, there's some conditions. Number one, you got to have a good breakfast, right? You've got to have some energy. Number two, you've got to take some archery lessons. You've got to have a general idea of how to do it. Number three, you've got to have a good attitude. You've got to have belief in yourself. Number four, we're going to blindfold Howard Hill, spin him around in circles, and face him completely in the wrong direction. I'm guessing you'll get closer to the bullseye than he will. Why? Because he's shooting in the wrong direction, and what can't you see? Or what can he see? He can't see the target. If he can't see the target, he can't hit the target. Just like if you don't have any goals, you can't achieve any goals. So it's so important to have those goals set for you. All right, so now we're going to have a little contest. Contest, awesome. First hand up, what are smart goals? What are the five words? Go. Shannon. Yep. First person that can give me, and I'm gonna give you one minute to think about this before I let you raise your hand. I want you to give me a personal goal, but then I want you to explain how it is, specific, measurable, attainable, you're gonna deal with any roadblocks that come away in a timetable. Let's see if Tim pulls this off. So my goal is I wanna play baseball at King's College. I, this is attainable because- I'm No, 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 specific. Oh, no, 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 Now it was time for the question and answer part of the presentation. What was your biggest failure? I don't want to sound cliche, but I really don't look at anything we do as really a failure. I kind of, John, if you haven't read John Maxwell yet, you should, he's fantastic. But he talks about failing forward, so everything is a learning experience. Biggest failure. Uh, you know, if you t- look at it through business and you read the first chapter, you know we, at one point we had 18 schools, then we went to 11. And the learning experience for me in that situation was action karate model of teaching and the business and everything that goes into making an action karate, the system is absolutely amazing. And my belief at that time was that the system carried everything. And one of my shortcomings at the time 
and still to this day is somewhat that way, is I see everyone only for their positive traits. And even though somebody else might say to me, but did you know that he did this or she did this? I only see like what their potential is and what they're good at. And I sort of just block out all the negative, which is in from a business point standpoint is just wrong. Because if, if someone has a flawed character and their character isn't right and they're not a good person, no matter how good our business systems are, they're not going to be good. So I think that was probably my biggest challenge and my biggest failure was thinking that the system was going to carry everything and looking past their character flaws and not taking it into account really at all. And then later on it coming back to be a very negative, dark time in my business and I guess my personal life at the same time. I want to bring up something very, very specific here. You ask what his biggest failure is. We ask a lot of people that question. And that's a great question. His answer was, when you're failing forward. There is nobody, anybody in here, anybody up here, anyone you know that is going to reach success without failure. You know my failures. I've shared my failures with you. I have a ton of them. I have big ones, I have little ones. The key is, if you're going to learn from that failure, is it really a failure? No, because you've learned from it. Is it a temporary setback? Quite possibly. Are you going to have temporary setbacks? 1,000% absolutely yes. The difference in the successful people and the non-successful people is the successful people are going to say, yes, I had this temporary setback, and how can it what? How can it benefit me in the long run? When you get in the habit of saying those speech patterns, of talking like that, that's what makes you a successful person. So a guy that has achieved a lot of success immediately said, well, I don't really consider failures because I learned from those failures. These are the thought processes that you need to get ingrained in your head and that the really successful people have ingrained in their head. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mr. Gordy. Can I add one quick? I'm sorry. Yes, please. Mike, for you guys that don't know this, Michael Jordan, legend has it that he was cut from his middle school basketball team. Imagine that he was cut from his high school. Wherever it was, he was cut from it. And at that point, he started practicing like a madman, which became his, what he was known for. And he decided that moment that he'd never be cut from a team again, period. Um, so, you know, that failure, if you look at Michael Jordan, you would never think he failed at anything, but he did. And when you also, does anyone remember the quote we did by Michael Jordan we did it last year? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember it exactly, but can anyone enlighten me or not? He talks about how many shots he missed, how many games he lost. At the very end, he, it was, he, it was him, he was Michael Jordan. And all the failures he had, he speaks about all that. Because honestly, when you think Michael Jordan, you're like, it's Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan doesn't mess up. Michael Jordan was cut from his team. Michael Jordan went over the list of shots he's missed and games he's lost, and it was astronomical. But he made the point to learn from it. So talking about failures, what inspires you to exactly push through your failures? Now, there's a lot of people that rely on me. You know, we have a pretty large team of instructors that their livelihood, their life, their income, their families rely on me. And I'm pretty petrified every day that if I mess up, they go down with the ship with me. So, um, you know, that, that is, scares me. And I'm also reading a book right now, I think it's called Built to be Great. And, it taught, and it's all these characteristics of successful people and one of the characteristics is they're all paranoid. <laughs> they're all paranoid, everything's about to collapse. And they talk about Bill Gates and all these other, you know, Larry Ellison, which I think is Oracle. And they're all like every day thinking, okay, everything's gonna end tomorrow. Bill Gates had a quote, and everybody obviously knows that Bill Gates personally is worth a little over $50 billion, besides Microsoft worth much more. He always thought that he was 18 months away from c complete collapse. And because of that, every day he woke up thinking, all right, what do I need to do to get better? And I think because of the life skills that we teach, so it helps me internalize it, and that you learn from Mr. Mills and that I read constantly, it just keeps, you know, my mindset is all about success and my mindset is all about what do I need to do to get better. I don't really focus on any of the negative stuff. I personally don't watch the news. I don't really read any newspapers. Um, I get some, the only news I really watch at all is John Stewart. Um, and that's once in a while, but other than that, I don't watch any news. So I don't think I have that negative influence. I think it's going to really be a complete collapse.
How do you personally determine your goals? Um, well, that's a great question. We constantly, my partner and I, um, have been, we've been together for 19 years, and we are constantly spend time reevaluating our own goals and also helping. A lot of our goals now are tied to the goals of the rest of our instructors. So we have 12 schools, um, and we sit down with each one of them a few times a year. And it might not be a formal where we sit down. It might be you know, a conversation when I'm driving. It might be on the golf course. It might be you know, out to dinner. And we talk to them about their goals. And a lot of times, my goals have to piggyback on top of their goals to help them achieve whatever it is they need to do. Sometimes I need to do something to help them achieve something. We're opening a school right now in um, Delran, New Jersey, or really Cinnaminson. And my brother, who I have, a, I have a big, huge family. My brother, who's 21, I want to say, or 22, he's going to be the head instructor of that school. Um, he's graduating from Temple right now. And so that has me petrified of, you know, he better be successful because not only do I care about him very deeply and emotionally, but I have to answer to my mother if he doesn't do very well. So now my goal, you know, part of my goal is making sure that he's successful. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Gold, and I'm very much like, I like business. So what would be your biggest tip on starting a business and like trying to get people to see things the way that you want it to be done? Getting people to see things the way that you want it to be done. I think most successful businesses, well, you love business, so you, you need to be educating yourself constantly. I am always reading a book. I'm always listening to something in my car. Const, I mean, const, I always have a DVD. And don't get me wrong, we watch a lot of Netflix. <laughs> and we, we're like Netflix professionals, really. If anybody has any questions on Netflix, I'd be your guy. But, you know, it's just a lot of changing around in the queue. But I also always have many DVDs on whatever it is that I'm trying to improve on, whether it's better at public speaking, better at investing, better at teaching, better at real estate, whatever. Um, so usually the most successful businesses are people that can see a little further in the future than, than other people can, and it's solving a problem for somebody else. So if you, so if you see something, it's like you're always doing something, you're always like, this is like the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Like, there's got to be a better way. There's probably a lot of other people thinking the same thing. And as far as there might be 100 people that think the same thing you think, but I believe the person who's driven more and you need to take this in the proper context. The person who's better at selling is going to be the person who's more successful at it. When people look at Steve Jobs as such an amazing visionary, I'm sure over half of you have iPhones or iPads or something in the room. When you really dig deep and research what he's done, most of the stuff that he's created, he didn't like invent the stuff. He didn't program the stuff. He didn't make up the stuff. He just took different trends that he saw because he was a visionary and jammed it together, and he is exceptionally good at marketing and promoting his stuff. So a lot of people, when they hear the word sales, they think of you know, some used car salesman in a, in a shiny suit, when the reality of it is you sell every day. You sell your parents, whatever your curfew is, or your, you know, your finances are, or whether they're gonna buy you a car. You're selling to your teacher who you want to give you a retest. You're selling, I heard somebody that wanted to skip a cl like art class to come here. You're selling that teacher, the teacher's selling you back. You know, and it's really just them seeing it from your point of view. So you do need to learn how to do that. So studying sales, I think, is outrageously important because it's really just studying influence. So the goals that I have aren't exactly money-making goals. And I'm one of those people that, like, I don't really care about money. I don't care if I have a lot. I don't care if I have a little. I don't really like money. But <laughs> um, what kind of, I mean, I don't, when I achieve my goals, I don't want to be struggling for my family and things like that. What kind of goals would you suggest that I set in order to not be struggling? Because I don't want to just focus on money, though. You need to talk about what your goals are. Um, I want to be a teacher at an inner city school. And all my summers off, I plan to do missionary work and things like that in other countries. So I don't, I don't like focusing on myself. And I don't like focusing, like I feel, um, selfish if I want to say like I want to have a lot of money like I don't I don't like that remember remember money's opportunity so for you the opportunity is if you're working in inner city school my guess is the budget on the inner city school is probably not super great 
my guess is that every classroom is lacking all kinds of supplies and books and stuff. So if you were able to, let's say, create a tutoring business because you already know how to teach, you already have people that need probably tutoring and stuff like that, and you were able to create that, that extra money that you earn, you can use it to make your classroom better. You can use it to go on missionary trips during, um, a cruise just went on, there was a whole group of missionaries on there, and I got a chance to spend some time with them, and they were explaining what they do, and it was pretty spectacular. But a lot of what they do, they have to spend their own money doing it. So the question for you, you should ask yourself is, could you do more if you were more financially successful with it? And again, the goals that we talked about had to do with money because you can measure money, and that's how most people think about goals. But setting your goals to be a, you know, to be a teacher or a certain grade level or however you want to make a specific measurable roadblock in timetable, it doesn't have to be about money. You know, once you get there, you're there. However, you also said, one of the things that you said is you don't want to have to worry about money either. So the, one of the other questions you want to ask yourself is, what does that exactly mean to you? And what I would suggest you do is figure out what you want your life to really look like at the end and you know, start with the end in mind. I think that's a Brian Tracy thing. And when I say what you want it to look like, you know, what kind of car do you want to drive? And you might not say, you know, I want to drive a Lamborghini, but you might say, I want to drive a Toyota blank, but I want it to run every day. And maybe you want something nice like a remote start. And you know, what kind of neighborhood do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the same inner city neighborhood that those kids? No. No, so, so what kind of house do you want to have? I mean, do you, you know, do you want a house equal to what your parents have? Slightly better, slightly worse? And then what kind of vacations do you want to go on? What kind of school do you want your kids to go to, which is going to be something to do with either going to private school or living in a, a neighborhood that has a good school system? And all the, once you add up all those things, you need to then backtrack and say, OK, well, the house is going to cost me this much a month, the schooling, my vacations are going to cost me this much. And you go through each one, and it's going to add up to some number that you're going to be pretty surprised it's going to be higher than you think. And I want to have, and when do you want to retire? Well, if you're a teacher, you'll probably have a great pension plan, which is awesome. And you'll go through it all. And then you, then you have to figure out what do you need to do to get to that end result when you're out of college, like at 22 or 23. What do I need to do to get to, so I can buy that house, so I can do this? And the inner city teaching may do exactly what you want, or it may not. And if it's not, how are you going to fill in that gap? And usually you do a, usually the way you fill in the gap, I don't know if it's the easiest way, but the simplest way in my own mind is whatever it is you love to do, so you love to teach, you create a tutoring program or you love missionary work, so you create, a, you create some kind of information program of teaching people how to be better missionaries or something, and they obviously have to invest in your program to do it because you invested to do it, and that creates the extra financial you need to do all the things you want to do that you believe in your mind are good. <laughs> and I think that one of the terrible misconceptions in society is money is the root of all evil. Money is bad. If you want money, you're this greedy, selfish, money-hungry person. And that really isn't the reality at all. Like Mr. Brenner said, money allows you to do more things. So maybe you can take a kid and you can make their Christmas because you have the money to do that. But if you don't have enough money to pay your rent or your car insurance, you, how are you going to help that kid? So having that is good. And it's funny because society has... This is not taught. These concepts are not necessarily taught in a lot of classrooms. And there's a reason. And this won't go on the show, but I'm going to tell you guys, and it's what we talked about. When schools were set up, they were meant to make factory workers. You do what you're told to do, and you do it the right way. Think about it. Bells. You go from class to class. You do this stuff. My goal is to get you thinking on your own, so you don't become that. So you can become that 3%. Shannon, I have no doubt, doubt that when you write your goals down, which I know you've done because you've shown me, that you're going to get those goals. You're going to reach that success. But why struggle? The parents that say money doesn't grow on trees or we don't have any money, like they're constantly telling their children that, that money is not in abundance. Sure it is. It can be. There's ways that you can get it. And you don't need to be concentrated on it all the time by any means. But life's a lot easier when you have it. And you could do a lot more good if you had the money to live on your own and help others as opposed to being so selfless that you don't have enough money to pay your own bills. Because then how much can you really concentrate on helping others if you can't even help yourself? And I think a, a fault that a lot of people have is they, they try to be so selfless 
that they don't concentrate on themselves, the more you concentrate on yourself and growing yourself, the more you can help others. Does that make sense? When you said selfless, I think it's selfish if you don't live up to your own potential, period. So if you're, you know, you could be a great, you know, if you're a great teacher, but you don't help other, and you see all these teachers around you that are terrible, and you don't create a program to make them better teachers, or offer tutoring, all the stuff that we just talked about, I think that's selfish if you don't live up. Like, I think it's selfish of me if I see a kid in a supermarket who has no confidence if I don't hand that mom like a guest pass to our school. Now you might look at that and say, oh, he's selling, he's marketing, and I guess there's a component of that. But I, without a doubt, believe in my mind and in my heart, and I know for a fact, that kid, that family will be better off if they come to our school and they learn our lessons. Once again, I'm going to jump in. The fake it to you make it is the same as doing what to your subconscious? Lying. You don't need to lie to other people, but lie to your subconscious, subconscious. Tell yourself that you already are that person you want to be. That's the whole concept of writing goals in the present tense. But don't even kid yourself. All the people that became successful, they were telling themselves they were successful in the beginning. That's how they got there. Think about the small successes you've had. You know, Grace was writing all over everything that she owned. I go to Penn State. Harley, when she says we're going to act, she doesn't say if I make it to Broadway. She says when I'm on Broadway. These are little things that if you doubt yourself, if you say what you say, your subconscious is going to be a little puppy. It's going to listen to you. So make sure you tell it what you want it to do. Because if you don't, you're only telling it the wrong things, which means the wrong things are going to inspire. Does that make sense? Ladies and gentlemen,